Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. Um, today, our webinar is Let's Talk About It, the role of OT and PT in AAC. And it is myself and Adriana Prince who are going to be presenting today. You'll get to hear a little bit about us in just a second. And we're going to go ahead and get started. I think you're in for a treat today. So first of all, our learning objectives um, is by the time we're done, we'd like for you to be able to define three methods of access for AAC, um, name some high and low tech tools, uh, model a novel message, um, and we're gonna be using a low tech core board unless you happen to have something with you, and um, identify two ways that AAC devices can be integrated to increase independence in basic ADLs, um, functional mobility or career goals. <clears throat> so little, I, I don't know if I know, um, some of you probably already know me because I'm a regular at Setsi. Um, I'm an occupational therapist by training, um, will always be an occupational therapist, um, and I'm an assistive technology specialist. I work for the Special Ed Tech Center um, one day a week and for the Edmonds School District the remainder of the week. Um, and these are my people in this picture. So um, First is my daughter Molly, and she is a finishing up her sophomore year at Ryder University. And my son Sean is on the other side of me in the picture, and he is um, in Washington D.C. and working there. And then uh, my son—I mean, not my son, my husband—who is like my son half the time, um, John is there. So those are those are my people, and we are enjoying a um, oh shoot, a trouble a Portland Trailblazers game here. So. Uh, Adriana, I'm going to let you go. I'm Adriana Prince. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, um, AT specialist um, at North Kitsap School District. Um, and I was a former educator in Texas as well, doing dual language um, teaching there. Um, and this is a, myself and my kids, Daniel on the left, Teo, who's almost two in the middle, and Avilin on the right, who's three, and my husband. And um, we are due with another baby in a month. All right, <clears throat> so I just pop in the chat for me. Um, why, why is it important to be able to communicate? You know, I just wanna hear what people, what, what is the why? Why should we be even having this be part of our practice? So go ahead and you can shout out or pop in the chat, whichever you'd like to do. Connection is life, yes. Tracy, have you been reading Brenda's book? To express your needs and wants. Um, oh no, do tell. So Brenda um, Del Monte, who works at the Special Ed Tech Center has just, has written a book called, I, oh gosh, now I'm not gonna come up with the title here. Um, I see you in there. And she talks a lot about human connection. Um, um, communication is a fundamental human right. Good. All right. Um, anyway, I totally recommend Brenda's book. It's awesome. Um, normally it's sitting right here by me, but uh, not today. Okay. Well, you know, you're right. It's really, really, um, I think above and beyond everything else. Um, I think everybody has great ideas, but Tracy, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, it's all about connection. It's all about human connection. And when that human connection happens, you can advocate for your, when you can make that human connection, you can do so many things um, independently. In fact, Brenda goes on to say that, you know, when she's writing a letter, you know, that she feels like um, human connection is a medical necessity. And I asked her if she had started putting that in her um, letters of medical necessity yet. And I said, I, said, I think you should, you could just, you know, describe how, it is medically necessary. And I think more than ever during um, the lockdown time during the pandemic, we all realized how connection is life. So um, again, we're looking at that human connection. Um, we're looking at being able to get our needs met. Um, loneliness is um, worse for health than smoking. I, I don't doubt that. Um, thanks for sharing that, Tracy. Okay. So the question we're here to answer today is, do I really have a role in augmentative and alternative communication? Isn't that the speech therapy, speech language pathologist job? Now, 
when I started in the district, I kind of, and that was when I started in the schools many years ago, I felt like we had these little silos that we worked in. And um, my um, idea of, um, you know, um, who did what was very different than it is now. But why don't you pop in the chat what you think your role is? I know we have some OTs, some AT specialists. Um, I'm not sure if we had a PT join us or not, but we, why don't you pop in the chat what you think your role in AAC is? Bless you. Allergies. You're not even in my yard. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything. Somebody has to have a, oh, now here they all come. Access and implementation as I interact with students depends, but so far it's been a backseat to SLP, develop fine motor skills to use the device, um, use a device with at all times. Good job. Yeah, those are all right in there. Um, so let's see. So, I know that one of my coworkers, awareness of the device that the students using, Sherry said, um, I know that one of, um, I used to work at North Kitsap, so that's how Adriana and I met. And one of the OTs over there who is probably the most amazing AAC modeler in the planet um, will um, quote me on this. If you can't communicate, you can't participate. So becomes all of our jobs when the students can't participate. Um, And then, you know, as therapists, our role is to help students be able to participate in their everyday activities, whether it's, you know, classroom activities, self-care activities, advocating, mobility, you know, that's, that's our role, social interactions. Um, so I'm going to give kind of a little more OT kind of background because that is my training. Um, but I, let's see. I'm going to switch these slides around. Um, so we're going to watch this first, and then I'm going to go back to the OT framework. Oh, and I forgot to share my sound. Hold on. Okay, here we go. My name is Dana. Can you hear that? I live in New York City with my husband and our two children, Maya and Will. My daughter, Maya, is 10 years old, and she has been using her AAC system since she was three. It's not an exaggeration to say that Maya's AAC use altered the trajectory of her whole life. It seems nearly impossible to summarize the impact of Maya's early access to robust AAC because it changed everything. Her AAC use, even as a very young child, opened so many doors, and each door led to new halls and doorways, and now we've ended up in a totally different wing in the building of life than we would have had access to without AAC. But that's very abstract. Here are some concrete examples of how AAC changed Maya's life. AAC let Maya share her personality. She made her first joke, looking out the window on a bright sunny morning and then pushing rainy and laughing shortly after she got her device. She was funny. AAC let Maya express her feelings like when her best friend was absent on the day she brought her favorite toy in for show and tell. And when I asked her how she felt about it, she said, heartbroken. AAC changed Maya's educational path. When the social worker at our school interview watched Maya and I talk through her device, she actually picked up her phone, called the principal and the head of the speech department and said, you've got to come see this little girl use her device in my office. And they ended up placing her in a very different class, the strongest academic placement than the one in which they had tentatively placed her. AAC let Maya show us that she had learned to read and that proof of literacy further expanded the rigor of her academic goals and the belief in her academic abilities. AAC let Maya self-advocate. On a particularly frightening day, when I arrived at the school to pick her up and she had bruises on her arms, we went straight to the principal's office and Maya was able to use her device to report what happened and whom she was with at the time. Words are power and non-speaking children can be powerless. Every single person that works with Maya knows that she has the words and the ability to tell others 
about their interactions with her, and that shapes the way that people interact with her. AAC changed everything because no amount of me saying that she's smart and funny and clever and driven is as powerful as 30 seconds of watching Maya talk for herself. The most frightening part of Maya's AAC story was that I found out about AAC completely by chance. We had seen dozens of doctors and therapists, including four speech-language pathologists, by the time that I independently heard about AAC and began to pursue a device for Maya. A goal that I would set for the AAC field would be to increase AAC awareness among pediatric medical and therapy providers, particularly those who practice in subspecialties that are likely to serve children with disabilities, such as developmental pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, geneticists. I'd like to see research done about the effects of training these practitioners about AAC and the subsequent number of patients that they could identify as potential AAC users and refer for AAC evaluations. Another goal that I would have for the AAC field is to continue pursuing ways to support AAC parents and families. It doesn't matter how much research we have about specific type of AAC devices or language targets, if families are abandoning their devices because they feel overwhelmed, disinterested, or unsupported. We need continued research into an emphasis on communication partner training and family support, so much so that speech language pathologists will feel that providing family support is an essential component of evidence-based AAC therapy. So I don't think I could say anything ever better than that. Um, so let's see if it'll go back to my, here. So what's the name of the city, this new city that you Okay, here we go. Let me move the bar. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Too many screens going on. So this is um, the communication bill of rights here. And um, let's look at it. Um, so was Maya able to express her true feelings? She was. She was able to understand communication. She could reject things. She could even report when something had happened to her, um, which so many kids without voices cannot report. Um, she could request information. She had access to information. Um, people communicated with her in a dignified manner. And I have an adult friend who uses eye gaze, and maybe some of you have met Karin Beer and some of his um, Setsi presentations. And when I ask him, how did people speak to you before you had your AAC device? He says, they talked to me like I was a baby. And um, so um, it helps, you know, definitely, um, you know, it helps people communicate to them in the way that they should be communicated to in a dignified manner. Um, it aids um, services and resources. They can be listened to. Um, they're included in social interactions. Um, you can learn things about them, like her mom learned that she was funny. Um, um, you can learn about um, life. They can learn about life and they can be offered choices. So um, super um, important that every child, regardless of their ability or disability, um, has the right to communicate. And then I want to do a little bit of kind of normal, anybody have any thoughts on the video, I guess, before I move on? Okay, I, I love the video just because I think she says everything that I have in my heart. Um, so looking at the normal developmental milestones, um, thinking about your typical developing kids, a new AAC user is going to go through similar stages and it's all going to be on their time frame and not yours. So, you know, looking at normal developmental milestones, you've got your cooing and gurgling and babbling and you might get your first words and then five to 40 words and then gradually it builds into this beautiful vocabulary and we've, you know, we all watch it happen with typically developing kids. Um, it's the same thing for um, our students who are AAC users, even if they're older, they still need to go through this developmental progression. Some of them will go through it quickly. And you know, you might have someone in like a week have the system figured out and you might have some that it takes years of modeling. 
um, for it to figure out. There's a student that Adriana and I have shared that um, we, we were using a pod book with her and we modeled and modeled and modeled and, you know, just like, oh my gosh, is she, you know, is it getting in there? And about three years later, she was in an IEP meeting and um, started flipping through her pod book, telling us that she was going to have pizza for dinner that night and um, some other things. And mom was like, those are all true. And none of us had seen her communicate to that. I mean, I wasn't there at the time I, Adriana and Lisa reported to me, but, you know, here she is just, she just kept going. And, you know, it just took that long to kind of fill her cup, um, fill her glass with all of that wonderful language for her to be able to make those motor pathways and access it and communicate in the way that she wanted. So even if you feel like they're not looking, they're not paying attention, it does get in there. Um, I'm going to show this video. Um, and I want you to think about as, especially as OTs and PTs, um, how this, this video is designed to be used for parents, but think about like things that you're, because we do so much of what we do in the schools in the context of play um, and understanding. And, um, and so just listen to this and see if it kind of resonated with me. Um, let's see what you guys think. language development pyramid shows us the different communication skills that children develop. It's important to understand that foundation skills such as attention and listening are really important for the development of skills higher up the pyramid. Playing games and interacting with your child in ways that provide an opportunity and reason to communicate will help to develop your child's attention and listening, understanding, vocabulary and turn-taking skills. These skills are just as important as being able to say words clearly. Playing with your child is a really important way to improve your child's language development. Remember, you are your child's best teacher. And the thing I always think about is, um, I think about like with my children who are adults now who are typically developing so often you know, I just did these things without thinking about it. And if you think of our students with complex disabilities and complex bodies, so often um, they don't have the same play and literacy opportunities because their parents are really doing like self-care and healthcare and nursing. And, you know, that when we're doing these things as therapists, when we're working with these kids, we're still working on that language development. Everybody is working on that with them. Okay, one more quick video. Um, and what does it mean when someone says model the students AAC? Because I know as an OT, when I first heard that, I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. What about you, Adriana? Yeah. So um, let's watch this little one. Um, simple, sweet um, video. There are no words.
right. Okay. So I love that video because it's like short and sweet and it's just, this is, you know, just talk with your talker with no expectation that they're going to talk back, just like you do with your typically developing um, infants and toddlers. So, um, so the OTs who are here in the group, this is our OT practice framework. And um, I want you to think back to Maya in the video at the beginning. And I want you to look at the contexts and environments that we support students in. And were, were there any of those on that list that she didn't need to use AAC for? No, I mean, the only one I could think of is if she were sleeping, but she would need to tell someone that she's tired or to go to sleep. So. You know, so our, it clearly in our framework as occupational therapists, the skills and occupations that we're supposed to be helping students become independent with um, clearly involve communication. So clearly we should be modeling that AAC in everything that we're doing. It's like learning a foreign language and being in like a dual language classroom or you're, you're in AAC immersion um, with these kiddos. So, you know, it definitely supports it. Um, this is what it says, um, best practices for OT in the schools. Um, the older version, I need to look this up in the newer version and update my reference, that OT practitioners support students in using their AAC in a variety of ways, including analyzing the motor components for assessing communication devices as well as developing and refining the motor skills needed to use these devices. OT practitioners work closely with speech and language pathologists to help students with limited speech develop their abilities to use speech generating devices. So definitely OT and PT big role in coming up with access and seating and positioning, but you need to be, you need to know how to use the system. And you need to be modeling that AAC with them as well. Um, and then this again, you know, looking back um, at the framework so much. So it talks about the area of occupation, the client factors, the performance skills, performance patterns, um, context and environment and activity demands, all of those things in our areas of occupation require communication. So it's there. Um, you may not drive the car and be the leader in it um, and the team, but you definitely need to be in the car and an active participant with it. And I just, I don't know, have, have any of you read Ghost Boy um, by Martin Pistorius? I think it's Pistorius. Uh, uh, he has a TED Talk as well. Um, and he was, a, as a child, ended up with, I believe, a virus and ended up being not able to move or speak. And this quote, um, I'm going to read it out loud just because um, it's just so powerful. Um, not having a voice to say I'd had enough food or the bath water was too hot, or to tell someone I loved them was the thing that made me feel the most inhuman. Words and speech separate us from the animal kingdom after all. They give us free will and agency as we use them to express our desires and refuse or accept what others want us to do. So, very powerful back to that communication is life or connection is life. Um, you know, he definitely um, has some powerful words here. Great book, by the way. Um, Adriana, I'm gonna let you yeah. go. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a PT perspective on AAC, um, speaking initially about the benefits of mobility for speech and vision development. Um, so uh, we use AAC and PT in our district all the time uh, with a lot of my kiddos that are medically complex. And um, one of the vision uh, benefits is like improving a lot of our students' CVI if they have that diagnosis um, in literature. Um, it shows that like movement and getting to move your body in space uh, improves their ability to see, like integrating that CVI and improving visual perception. Uh, mobility also increases motivation. I don't know how many of you all had uh, PE as your favorite class in elementary school, but if you ask kids what's their favorite part of the day, they usually say recess and PE. 
and a lot of those um, are movement based mobility sort of breaks from school and uh, our children that we work with um, are no exception to that. And so um, developing a self initiated movement so um, saying like I want to go, I want to go to a different part in the school. Um, you know, we use that a lot in the AAC, like, oh, where are we going to move today? Where are we going to go? You know, are we going to walk to my office? Are we going to walk to the PE room? Are we going to go out to recess? And having that um, empowerment to say, like, I want to go, I or I want something different, um, I think is motivating for them as well. It improves cognition mobility, um, improves receptive language, um, improving the development of play and social skills. Uh, I think that like I said, in recess and PE, um, it's a very social part of the day. It's when the kids get to talk about things other than academics and they, you know, they get to talk more. Um, so, and it improves higher level processing and which we know exercise and movement uh, improves cognition um, and then leads to independence. So feeling like they are in charge of moving their body in space, um, it makes them feel more empowered and engaged. So uh, I'm going to kind of go through some pictures and videos of some kids um, that I work with. Um, so like uh, the, this is a child on the left in a swing at recess and she's swinging with some of her peers. And so I'm swinging her and she's working on her, she has decreased core strength. And so we're swinging and I'm stopping it and she's having to keep herself righted. And then um, I say on her talker, um, uh, I say, we're going to stop. And then I model to her you know, go, and then she, and then I keep going. And then initially I'm doing it for her and modeling it. And then she started to do go or more. And so, and then we have a song that we like to sing anytime we're, you know, you know we go, 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 and we stop and we go, 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 and we stop and we kind of sing that song. And so that they're kind of motivated with the music and the movement and, you know, she's smiling away and pressing go, go, go more, more, more. So that's kind of an example of integrating AAC into treatments. Um, and then uh, this lady on the right, uh, who's a high schooler um, in PE, um, she's in strength and conditioning class. And we're using the uh, power mobility, the, the head array for mobility. Um, and she's also uh, practicing using that head array with her AAC device when she's not in, in a PE. Um, so go ahead and play that video. And she is my heart. She has been my, my biggest teacher in my whole career. So she's using the head array to go left, right, and straight. And so uh, with that example, um, we're, we're working on like uh, decreasing her the wait time that she needs to hit the head array um, and that she will have carry over when she's using it as a communication device. I find that we have a lot of improvement in wait time when we integrate uh, the head array into mobility. Um, but also in this class, she was super highly motivated because all her other peers were running around. So she was driving way more than she normally does in like a hallway. Um, she was wanting to move and then the, we had music playing when I didn't take the video, like her favorite artist. And so she was just driving around and smiling. Um, so um, mobility goes hand in hand with AAC in the sense that we're working on the same skills. Like she's using the skills to move, but then we'll carry it over with the skills to communicate. And especially when we were looking at getting her AAC device and getting her wheelchair, it was important that the access method for the wheelchair was going to work with her device, you know, and so it involved speech, OT, PT, the whole team with these kids, the team needs to be making these decisions um, to get the right thing for the, um, the student. Yeah, you know, I think with her, we had a tech list, so eventually, eventually we could, eventually she could do social media or different things that um, were social things if she wanted to with her head array. All right, and now this friend that I have, I'll do a couple slides on her. Um, she's a friend who, when we first started working with her in preschool, she like had barely any head control, was had difficulty even sitting up. We were working on like infant skills in the preschool. Um, but now that she's in um, lower elementary school, 
we've been working on getting some um, assistive technology for her that will uh, improve her her uh, her school experience. Um, so uh, here she has, um, we have some lock line tubing with the positioning of her AAC device so that it's right in her lap so that she's able to easily access her uh, AAC device. Um, and then she has been working on self-propelling her wheelchair. So when we initially got her wheelchair, well, Heidi was in our district, when we initially got her wheelchair, um, she was just barely moving it forward at all. You know, we didn't, we, that was a big step for her. And then now she's able to communicate on her device, roll down the hallway, presses the, the door open, goes through, and, you know, and tells us, you know, where she wants to go and moving through space, but she doesn't, she's just starting to talk. But if she didn't have her AAC device, you know, she would just be saying one or two words, maybe, but with her AAC device, she's able to say so much more. Um, and so here's an example of the go talk now with the four squares um, for her that we use for PT when I come in and sometimes she just wants more sensory experiences. So we say, oh, do you want a rocking chair or the hairbrush, which are motivating for her? Um, or are we gonna go on a walk or are we gonna ride in our wheelchair? So let's ride. And so she has the ability to choose, um, which uh, makes her feel more empowered. And also um, she tends to have get frustrated when she doesn't have a choice. So um, she's able to be happy at school. Um, so next page. Um, so here's some examples of some assistive technology that we use in, integrated with her AAC devices. So um, the middle picture actually was her in kindergarten um, and she was, um, she, she was in the kid walk eight trainer, which we used with a desk that we had elevated because we found that she was more um, engaged in her activities when she was in a standing position. And so we had it um, in, a, in a tall position for the time that she was in her classroom. So she was able to push through her legs and the movement helped her feel um, more engaged. And then we had the AAC device on the slanted desk, uh, Riften desk, so that she was able to access her words. And another reason is because in kindergarten, as you know, it's a very active classroom. And so a lot of times kids come up and put things on the board or they, they put, uh, you know, cell activity, social emotional, like, how are you feeling today? And, you know, who wants to come up and tell us how they feel? And so um, one of my favorite moments was her, uh, you know, pulling back with her gate trainer and walking forward to the, to the board and, and saying, you know, how do you feel? And most of the times the parents would say, I'm good, you know, trying to, to be the voice, but I kind of facilitated her going up to the board and I kind of helped her lift her arm, but then she got to choose and she said, I'm feeling cool. <laughs> and so then the whole class was like, Stephanie feels cool, you know, and that was like, you know, a really big deal for the class to see that she was, you know, she, she had her own voice and uh, it was new to her, um, her voice. And, um, uh, but that's an example of that. And then now she's progressing on the right. This was just last week. Uh, she's progressing to a gate trainer um, with, uh, with a, a rift and pacer um, without uh, any pommel. So she's being able to stand up on her own and walk with just a little bit of guidance. So she's just improving so much. Um, but we always have her talker with her. So sometimes other, some paras are better than others about it. But I always walk into a classroom and I always ask the kid, hey, where's your talker? You know, because um, I feel like it's my role. If, if I don't have communication, then I'm not serving the student with their mobility because I feel like communication is inherently part of them being social when they move or being social with others in the hallway. So how are they supposed to say hi in the hallway if they don't have their voice? And so, um, yeah, I don't know. If maybe I've just drank the Kool-Aid to always integrate it, but I love it. <laughs> I've been shoving it to you for years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I feel if I don't have their voice, then I'm missing out on communication with them on the things that they want to tell me about. Um, other things that I really love about the, the assistive technology with gate trainers um, is, uh, you know, sensory play. So here I have um, a student here with an eye gaze, a Toby Dynavox. Um, and uh, with a DC mount and uh, she's uh, can communicate like I want to do something different or um, I want you know I want to I want to play and they have a great sensory room at that school and she loves the sensory room so she's you know we're working on her communicating that and then we put her in the gate trainer and we have her stand you know up to an hour a day um, and usually two bouts of 30 minutes um, and 
we just get her gait trainer right up against the sensory bins and she's just all in it. She's such a, you know, she just loves that. And um, if she had, was in a wheelchair, we wouldn't be able to get up as close to these tables. Um, and so we usually use a kid walk with her, but we're trialing a Grillo right now to see. So this is another example with the Grillo um, for uh, sensory play. And so highly motivating uh, activities uh, done in standing. So. And then here's another friend of ours um, who uh, is highly motivated by movement and balls, uh, about basketballs. And um, he actually couldn't tolerate a classroom uh, very well at all. Um, so the only places where he was happy was when somebody was pushing him in his wheelchair for, um, for a half an hour or an hour a day when we would put him in his uh, kid walk. And so uh, we would just put him in PE and bounce balls or, and then, um, or take him out on the playground. And it was the time when he was happy. And my coworkers make fun of me because they say, it's not fair, everyone always wants to go to PT. <laughs> and they said, they won't do anything for me in speech or OT, but they always wanna go with the PT. And I think it's because uh, kids like mobility, they like movement, they like PE, they like recess. And so it's a perfect opportunity for us to integrate AAC in because that's when they're most motivated. Um, the other thing I want to jump in and just say is like when I know the team at North Kids Up is really great about this is um, when they don't have their device, they've all been working with them on a really good yes, no response. And so they can still ask them yes, no kind of questions, you know, do you want more? Are you done? Um, and I think that's really important as well, because there are going to be moments when, you know, like that eye gaze device, hooking it up on a, you know, um, kid walk or a gait trainer is really a bear. Um, but I, I mean, I think if you take them out of that, you need to either have, you know, a low tech or be able to do some yes, no kind of things. And the team there is really fantastic at working on that as part of their IEP goals as well. Yeah. And as, like you said, as much as we, if more than we use the AAC devices, we use the, the movement, uh, communication or like, Hey, I use a lot of, uh, Hey, we're going to move you and look up at me if that's okay. Or I, when I reposition, I say, hey, uh, is this more comfortable? Look up at me if this is more comfortable. And, and so then, you know, a lot of kids will raise their eyes up or, you know, their head up. Um, or sometimes if they make a vocalization, I say, oh, I can tell that's that you're upset. You don't like that. Let's do something different. So it's making like verbalizing their nonverbal, their um, verbal or nonverbal communication out loud to make sure that they feel heard even when they don't use a device very well sometimes. Um, when they're emerging with that skill. Um, but this, this, this uh, boy here, he, uh, he has a setup. He loves music videos. Um, so his home setup that we- oh, gosh, that my, Sorry about that. That was- Oh, me. you're good. His home setup at home uh, that we kind of started at school, but he doesn't tolerate school very well, is um, his home setup we have is a, a switch interface um, so that he's able to, you know, we pause a movie, uh, a YouTube dance video, and then he has to hit the switch in order for him to play the video because he's highly motivated by um, playing videos. Um, and so at home, his mom was saying that's his favorite thing to do. So we integrated that in so that he was able to reach and play the video on that. Um, and then also we have a um, a Mac output button that says like, I want something different. So if he's at home and he presses the button, he can say, I want something different. And so she knows that he wants a different video. And we usually do that with like, we try to have him sit upright and reaching. So even though that's um, AAC and, uh, you know, reaching um, with OT activities, um, I feel like we kind of all work on it together. So, and so now this, uh, this friend of ours, um, he has, uh, he has, this is his normal setup on the left here um, where he has the uh, hand switch. Um, and so he hits the, the buttons to communicate as it um, scans through communication options. Um, and so, and then we have that mounted with the day C. Um, and so uh, we worked as a team with the OTPT speech therapist. Um, we co-treat a lot with this kiddo to get the positioning perfect because we all have ideas and I feel like we do the best when we all combine at the same time sometimes. And so getting that, that switch in the perfect place and um, using, uh, you know, ice packs that are not cold or different things to position him or towel rolls or different things to get him uh, more upright. Um, and then also uh, experimenting with different um, switches, um, like, you know, he's able to 
activate his power wheelchair with his head um, for mobility. Ready for that video to go. Almost, almost. I'll, I'll let you know when. Um, he's uh, he's working on that skill, um, but he also sometimes will put the switch by his elbow or we'll put it over by his chin or his face so he can just not hit the switch for communication with his face. Um, uh, but this is one example of a kiddo that when we first started working with him for reaching, for activating switches for the head array, his wait period time was like 20 seconds, 25. So we'd walk down I the hallway. counted once it was 50. Yeah. And we say, and you go, 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 and you stop. And then we'd wait. And then he'd pick up his head slowly and hit the switch and move forward for a couple seconds. And then we'd say, we go, 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 go. And then he'd stop and we'd say, and you stop. You know, and we go, 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 go. We go fast and we go slow. And so we would just integrate music because he loves music um, into him learning how to drive. Um, and so uh, this is an example of him um, now uh, driving in PE. And it was very loud. So I turned up the, turned off the volume for you guys. So it was very loud in that classroom. Um, so he also loves Lightning McQueen. So we always do driving. We go drive in the gym. Um, and so he... He was uh, doing right and left. And then um, he was also picking his head all the way up to hit the switch in the back in order to drive forward. And that's a new skill uh, for him being able to get that high. Um, and so uh, that's just an example of um, using head array. And eventually we hope that he'll use um, more, uh, the head array more for communication. But right now he's using the hand switch, the hand uh, switches, so. Okay. Um, and so uh, another thing I just, because I have a dual language background from when I was a teacher, um, I just really loved this, um, this student who came in from a, um, a different country. This is his, her first time ever being in school, because um, in the country she comes from, they, um, kids with disabilities don't really go to school. And so um, uh, we had this an example of the kids in the class are working on shapes and they have a puzzle of shapes. And then um, we pulled out the touch chat and uh, my coworker, Shannon, uh, was able to do the touch chat in Spanish. And then I was finagling with the settings because the first time we used it, it had the English pronunciation of Spanish words. So it would be like Verde, you know, instead of Verde. And so we played with that. And so then we were able to get it to do uh, Spanish pronunciation. And then uh, we brought in um, uh, for communication partner training, her sister comes in from, from her, the second grade classroom. And for uh, parts of the day, she comes in and, and speaks with her and plays with her. And so uh, I brought this while we were doing PT because she's uh, working on able, being able to sit upright. Um, we put her in a chair that she's uh, having to work her core a little more. And then I brought in the, um, the touch chat in Spanish and uh, taught the sister how to use it with her, just modeling and talking about the shapes. And then, um, and she was just excited to use it with her sister and then her sister uh, is learning how to use it. And so um, just an example of how important it is for uh, communication partner training and integrate it into a, into a, a PT session um, there. Um, and so, and one thing she's really highly motivated with is body parts. So she says, boca, boca and mouth. And uh, so going to the bo body parts pages, just one week working on body parts. And, uh, and uh, after one week, she was already um, using like five or six different body parts in Spanish. So it's just really awesome how um, she's taken off. Another thing uh, that's just a vision uh, as the AT specialist in my district, um, thinking about um, mobility, orientation and mobility, and even though I'm not the orientation and mobility teacher at the school, um, how important you know, we work together um, for kids to know where they are in space. Um, so this child has uh, impaired vision. Um, so she has to have all of her curriculum um, modified and enlarged by the vision specialist at the school. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we did a trial this year of an, this awesome device. It's called the Cloverbook Pro uh, by, uh, made by Irie, I-R-I-E. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. But um, so it has a uh, two, uh, I just wanted to share this because it's awesome, but you don't have to play the video yet. But um, it has two screens and the top screen, you can flip it between having a magnifier at the bottom uh, or the magnifier page on the top. Um, uh, this is an example in a second um, of the magnifier displaying both the top and the bottom because we were learning how to use it at the time. 
but when we uh, progressed using it, we were able to um, have the magnifier on the bottom. And then on the top, you could have the camera so that she could scan and look around the classroom with the camera. So she would follow the teacher at the whiteboard and then she would be able to look at the materials below. And so the first time we were able to put the camera screen on the top, we were in her class and she scanned to the around to the door and she's like, oh, it's Miss Pat, that's where Miss Pat is? Is that where she is always? And it's like, yeah. And so she, and then she turned it and she goes, oh, look over there, look where they are. And it was like, she never, if she looked up, she would see blurs of people and not really any detail, but because it was um, she was on the screen, she was able to know where herself in space. And so when we take it in your classroom, she was able to, to interact with her peers more from her table. And so this is an example when I asked her, um, the other important part of that is uh, includes, including her in her spontaneous activity. So yeah, the vision specialist had created all these materials for her math and English, but they did a random cell uh, social emotional learning activity. And they said, here they put the tiny little picture of the faces of how she felt. They were tiny on the bottom of this page and we put it under the magnifier. And I said, hey, how do you feel? And so this video, her response is so awesome. Go ahead. How are you feeling? How are you? Feeling goofy and silly. Goofy and silly. I'm not kidding. I'm goofy and silly right now because my papa thinks I'm silly and goofy. Good job. So, right. yeah, so that's just an example of a, another uh, assistive technology device that we use. How are you feeling? Um, and so the power inclusion, all this is uh, including our, our students in. Um, you know, the movement, the, um, the, the activities that their peers are doing, the play-based social activities. Um, so this is from a school that I'm actually at right now. And uh, they had a t-shirt contest and it, they said for their, um, their 5K that they do every year. And so these are just two submissions that kids um, put in for the t-shirt contest. And the PE teacher um, shared them with me. And she said, this is the first year, you know, we just started doing way more inclusion in our school. This is the first year that we've had uh, two kids with, in wheelchairs or a dolphin in a wheelchair included in the t-shirt uh, submissions. And so it uh, just kind of shows um, that that um, inclusion is paying off, that the kids are seeing them as part of their community in their classroom. So awesome. Oops, oh my goodness. I have a new computer and the mouse is so touchy. It is like crazy. Um, all right, so we've got just about nine minutes left. So I'm gonna kind of buzz through the rest of these slides pretty quickly. Thank you, Adriana, for those videos. It makes my heart happy because I started a lot of these kiddos and to see that um, the team there at North Kitsap is just, I'm just so proud of them all. They're doing a really great job um, getting those students included and in working on academics and um, AAC being everyone's job. So kudos to you guys. Um, there's low and high tech AAC. Um, there's a variety of things. There's, I put the link to the webinar I did on how to use an alternative pencil and an alternative pencil is basically an alphabet strip that lets kids go through the emergent stages of writing and scribbling. Um, so that is definitely, if you have some time, watch the video. Um, I'll probably do another one of another alternative pencil video next um, webinar for Setsi next year at some point. Um, looking at choice boards. Yes, no head movements right there. I have linked a bunch of really fun activities as well as a um, Tuesday tip um, from the Special Ed Tech Center on how to do yes, no head movement. Sometimes your low tech is a vocalization. Um, the one gal at the high school in the wheelchair, she's got a ya yeah and a na nah, um, in addition to you know everything else. Um, looking at um, core boards and, and that's, um, core boards are being used more and more around districts, and if you want to learn more about modeling aided language, incorporating core boards into activities, if you go to the Project Core website that's linked here, there are all of these like 10 minute modules and they're excellent. Um, and it goes through um, everything from why, how to use it in the classroom to all of the comprehensive literacy for all um, components of teaching, reading and writing. Um, they might have a communication book, um, could be a pod book or a paper copy of a high-tech system. Your high-tech system might be 
um, an AAC app on an iPad, and there's a variety of those. Um, they could have a dedicated device that their insurance has purchased, and there are a variety of those as well. Um, and these are just some samples of some different things. So um, I really, I love the alternative pencil because if you can give them the power of 26 letters of the alphabet, it is um, amazing. I have a friend who's in her 20s and her preferred method of AAC, she can use a high-tech system, but her preferred method of AAC is an alphabet board that is on her lap tray. And it ends up almost looking like word prediction. So she starts moving her hand to, to different letters. And if you get the first two or three letters, you've got her word, if you know the context. And I asked her why she likes to use that instead of the high-tech system. And um, she said, because when with the high-tech system, a lot of times by the time I've generated my response, the conversation has moved on. And when I'm using my alphabet board, someone has to be there to do my you know, figure out what I'm spelling so I stay in the conversation. So um, they all have preferences. They all have times when they use one versus the other. Um, so that's just a, it's an interesting, it was really great to talk to her and find out what, what, what her reasoning was. Um, positioning, you know, our roles are positioning, access method. We've talked about this a little bit already. Um, layout considerations. So if you've got someone who's doing scanning as their method of communicating, um, you know, as an OT or a PT, I, a lot of times I don't, as an OT, I will look and be like, okay, to get to that word on this system, it's like six switch hits. But on this system to get to that word, it's like three. And so looking at kind of how the systems are laid out and what is the most efficient for them. Um, the speech therapist often determines the appropriate system and then the OT and PT collaborate on all of these other things. So um, it's definitely a team approach. Be sure to look at in all, how are they gonna communicate in all positions? Um, sitting, standing, lying down in the kid walk. Sometimes it's a low tech method that they're using, um, laying in bed, um, like this little guy here. Um, but when you're looking at seating at, at communication, um, seating matters. So this is my friend Al. And in the first picture over here, um, he really can't access anything in that position. And so we got him out and did a, a mat assessment and kind of figured out where he needed to be supported, um, got him supported correctly, and he was able to drive a power wheelchair um, that way. And so if you don't have that nice, if you don't have the positioning and the seating figured out, it is really hard for them to do the motor planning to access their system. So that's super, super important. Um, you know, we've talked about these things already. So some different access methods. Key, um, if you have never used a key guard, um, I, which is what this young girl is using right here, um, I have become the biggest fan of them now. Um, and so you can have a student who maybe can access 24 icons without a key guard and you give the key guard, which is like plastic that has the, the holes cut out um, and you can move them up to like twice as big to like a 48 or a 60 cell. Um, a lot of kids, not every kid, um, but super um, definitely worth experimenting with a key, key guard to get more um, language that is more easily accessible. Um, there's, you know, indirect access, eye gaze, head tracking, switches for scanning. There's auto scanning where it automatically scans the screen and you stop it with your switch to select the word. There's step scanning, which where you move row and column. Um, and then there's point scanning, which is what you see on the iPad where you have like a bar that moves across and then a bar that moves um, down and kind of where they meet when you select them. And that's a really fast way. I've got a young a second grader um, in Edmonds and she uses um, point scanning to communicate and she is fast. Um, and then just know that access develops and refines over time. I think as therapists, we tend to kind of always go for the hand to be our access place. And a lot of times there's a place that's much more efficient and involves less motor planning um, than the hand. And so you might start with a hand and be like, yeah, no, that's not gonna work. Um, head is usually a really good spot. 
um, head control develops first. And even if you have someone kind of down here, if you give them something really exciting and interesting, you usually will get that head up so that they can um, access that. Um, and really try to, if you can get two access methods, that makes driving a power chair more easy. Um, more easy, that does not sound right, easier. Um, and then if you can get a third switch, that makes changing the modes in the wheelchair a lot easier. So I always look for like three access points. Um, and then just remember it's all sensory. You know, you've got to look at all, you know, everything is sensory and you have to look at all of those sensory needs. And the video kind of showed what aided language input was. Um, if you go to Project Core, there's way more here, but here's just a quick graphic. Um, so you want to provide input in the mode that they're going to use. So if our typically developing kids, we speak to them, they're going to speak. So if you've got a student who um, is using some type of aided language input and you um, speak to them and expect them to use their AAC device without modeling it, they're never going to learn it. Um, so what you need to do is you need to be doing the aided language and spoken language of their system and then they'll be able to use, learn to use their system. And these are just all the places you can, Adriana did a great job of explaining, incorporating it into all sorts of things. And you just wanna think about long-term independence. Where do you want them to be? And I was gonna have you create a message, but we're like out of time. But so our message is, let's go to the playground. I mean, I'll do the message for you quick. So you might have go outside um, or time to clean up. Um, I'm gonna use this keyboard. So we're, we're gonna do something different. And um, Adriana, you can help me here if I can't. Put in, so you'd say, you know, we're gonna clean up, it's time to put in. Yeah. Um, we're all done. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we are right now. We are all done and um, <laughs> These are two of um, an amazing speech therapist and OT in North Kitsap and a lot of the students there use um, a low tech version of pod and these gals were at a Corey's day at the farm where everybody gets to go and ride horses and do farm things and they had their pod book on um, during the whole um, day they went in fact Lisa over here has been known to buckle up in her car and still have it on so I'm waiting for her to get pulled over and speak pod to the police. So. <laughs> All right, any questions? You can go ahead, again, um, we can stop the recording, Miari.